Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra. Every now and then there's a new swell of complaints that America has strayed from its Christian roots. But others wonder if this is a myth. Was the U.S. really designed to be a Christian nation? What is a Christian nation anyway? Well, our guest host will explore this today with two notable historians. Join us on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Scott Welch. My guests today are Mark Knoll, professor of history at the University of Notre Dame and author of many works on the history of early America and of evangelical Christianity. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. And George Marsden, also an author and historian of evangelical Christianity and early American history who held the McEnany professorship at Notre Dame before retiring and handing it over to Mark Knoll. Welcome, George. Thank you, Scott. Nice to be here. Where did this all originate from, uh, the notion of, of, of a Christian America uh, that we find so current in the dialogue today? Where, where did it come from? It developed as a really important idea early in the 20th century when the United States was becoming, was, was going from a transition from the Victorian era to a modern era during the Jazz Age and there was a lot of secular ideas were developing and permissiveness in sex and education and the like. Things were changing very rapidly in, 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 in some very tangible ways. And so people uh, who were more traditional Christians began to say, well, we're losing the faith that we had back in the, in the founding days. And they projected a, a mythology of not only was there some Christianity back in the early times, but we were essentially Christian. That what has happened in the 20th century then on into the 21st century is that elements in early American history are picked up. The Puritans of New England thought of themselves as a kind of chosen nation. Certainly in the 19th century, there was a sense of manifest destiny that God had ordained the nation to move to the West Coast and even in some cases to move throughout all of North America. But those um, elements, as, as George indicates, were, I think, uh, uh, amplified during the 20th century when religion came back into public life. During World War II, Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill talked about the defense of Christian civilization over against the Nazis. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s brought back a sharply focused religious element in American life. The, the rise of the new Christian right brought back again a sharply focused religious element. And in this, these modern circumstances, then the bits and pieces that were in some cases accurate, in some cases entirely mythological of early American history became important once again in public debate. Now, you say there's always been a strong desire to mimic God's Old Testament relationship with Israel. And we almost, I've heard where people put themselves, will put us as a nation alongside of or calling ourselves Israel in some ways. Um, how is it that we were able to take over Israel's role? I find that interesting. It's, it's strange as, as a biblical interpretation mm -hmm. because in the Bible, Israel is Israel and the new, you know, whatever the new Israel is, it's not the United States. But th this, this goes to the Puritan origins of New England, that, that the Puritans tended to look, they, they looked to the Bible for everything, which is a good thing, but they tended to therefore see themselves as in the same relationship to God as Old Testament Israel and use you know, the, the Old Testament as a kind of political blueprint. And so they, they saw everything that happened as judgments of God on them as, as, as a nation. And it's good, again, very good things about that. But it also tends to exaggerate the role of the colonists as having a, a special position before God. And, and, and certainly, whatever the Old Testament says, it says Israel is in some sort of special relationship to God, and that's a one-time thing. And the New Testament makes it pretty clear that all nations are equal, and whatever, you know, whatever nation or tribe or race or whatever, everyone stands equally. Uh, and uh, so, for 
very plausible reasons, the Puritans lost sight of that New Testament idea and, and adopted the idea that they, they stood before God just about the same way as Old Testament Israel had. Speak a bit more uh, on the notion that the, the, the founding documents of this nation, I mean, people, uh, I've heard people talk about the fact that they are just very, very religious documents and it is looked upon almost as something that um, it, there was just really almost a church service happening during the, during the process of, of these documents. I, is that true? Is that not true? Or? There certainly was a great deal of religious attention at the time of the Declaration of Independence and the time of the Constitution, but it was d diffused. It, it was spread about in, in the society. So reading the Declaration of Independence, there's a reference to the Creator, there's a, there's a reference to God in very vague terms. Uh, the Constitution has a reference to the year of our Lord, and the Constitution prohibits religious tests for public office, but these are the only religious statements. There were proposals to, to add God language to the preamble of the Constitution, but part of the, the situation in the 1770s and the 1780s was that already the United States began to have the plural religious situation that we know today, and although it was mostly Protestants with a few Catholics and a very few Jews, had there been any one statement of religion, it would have irritated or offended others, and it would have been much harder to bring the nation together. So I don't re read the early documents of the United States as militantly secular, but neither were they explicitly Christian. Yeah, I'd say the Constitution is a remarkably secular document in its lack of religious reference. Not that it was anti-religious, it took for granted that there was a lot of religion around and would protect the religion that there was, but the Constitution itself was stated in, in pretty basically practical terms. This is the way the government works and uh, wasn't referring to higher law or, or it's explicitly. Well, when you look at the uh Founding Fathers, uh, you know, original documents. Do you find in your research that there is a depth of faith, a depth of Christian conviction in the writings? The most that the Founding Fathers expressed Christianity was what we call deism, which is basically a belief in a creator God. But most of the Founding Fathers pretty carefully avoided Trinitarian Christianity, traditional evangelical Christianity and would talk about a creator and religion in a general sense, but not the particulars of Christianity or the necessity of dependence on God's grace for salvation and, 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 and so forth. So there's, that's one of the reasons why the situation is a little bit blurred because there's a lot of talk of religion, but not a lot of real substantial Christianity. There were some people of faith in colonial America, uh, but the evangelists in colonial America, for instance, Jonathan Edwards, who lived just before the American Revolution, or George Whitfield, who was a great popular evangelist, the Billy Graham of the era before the Revolution, both of them thought most of these colonists are not evangelical Christians, that they were uh, it was only a, a, a minority of evangelical Christians, and, and that's certainly true of the Founding Fathers, that only a minority of them would be evangelical Christians. The, the standard definition that's now used for evangelical Christianity has been developed by a British historian, David Bebbington. It emphasizes first uh, a conversion experience, emphasizes second trust in the Bible as a supreme authority, emphasizes third activity in uh, Christian life, and then emphasizes the cross of Christ as, as the key matter. This is a pretty good definition for a term that is fairly loose, but it's a good definition for most purposes today. There clearly were evangelical Christians of the sort we would recognize today. John Jay from New York, Elias Boudinot from New Jersey, Roger Sherman from Connecticut, Samuel Adams from Massachusetts would be people very similar to what we think of as evangelical Christians today. But uh, the, major, the major founders, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, are hard to categorize. They're not Orthodox Christians. They weren't simply deists, but they tended to be believers in God 
who were quite nervous about certain aspects concerning Jesus. Benjamin Franklin, for example, late in his life, wrote to a, to a minister in New England and said, I know that you think I'm, I don't believe correctly about Jesus, because I don't, in fact, think that he was God, but I'm going to die soon and I'll find out. So he was making a joke of it. And he, he was serious about religion, as, as all of the founders were, but, but to call them uniformly evangelical Christians in a modern sense of the term just, just doesn't fly. In 1983, you uh, both penned, along with one of your other colleagues, you penned a book called In Search for Christian America, or The Search for Christian America. The Christian Nation books sell tens of millions, and over here, your book sells less. We're a free enterprise society, and that's a, a, a good thing in, in many respects. And our religion is free enterprise, and that's one of the reasons why it thrives. But in free enterprise, the simple story, the this is right, that's wrong kind of answer, that's what captures people, uh, people's attention. If you say this is nuanced, there, it, it's a complicated story. There are ways in which early America had some really good Christian elements, but there are other elements of, of, of early America which were appalling, appallingly non-Christian or uh, sub-Christian, anti-Christian, yes. immoral. That's a complicated story, and, and it's not one that you, can, you know, it doesn't preach. <laughs> and so th th what the scholars are saying is, is something that needs to, you know, it, it's harder to absorb. And so you'd need people who are willing to take the time to, to say, well, let's look. Uh, in every culture, you know, we, if, if you believe in traditional Christianity, you believe in human depravity, for instance. So we would expect that uh, every culture would be a mix of some good things, some uh, less good things, and, and that's exactly what uh, people through the ages have said. I think what I would add is, is that the circumstances of the recent past have contributed to the situation for understanding the deeper past. So in, in the course of American history, there has been a secularization, and there has been a playing down of some distinctive Christian elements early on. I think some of the Christian America books have actually done a good service for pointing out, for example, that Christopher Columbus studied the scriptures. He, th he thought the Bible was very important. They've done a good thing in pointing out some of the Christian uh, elements behind the separation of church and state and the practice of religious freedom. But again, selectivity and comprehension is the key. To find out that Christopher Columbus f read the scriptures and was very serious about the Bible is a good thing. But then so is, is understanding what happened with Columbus's voyages with respect to the natives that he encountered in the Caribbean islands, which was disaster. What do those encounters uh, with the natives uh, tell us? Well, I think that, that whole history of treatment of minorities is, is, a, is a very important matter and should be a very important matter for Christian people where, where the scriptures are so clear that God's mandate is to take care of those that other people are not taking care of. And on that particular score, the colonial period, the, the new American nation just didn't do, did not do anything that would come close to being Christian by, by a modern understanding. And this would be one of the areas where I think George would agree and many secular historians would agree that the hypocrisy of so-called Christians was really a bad problem. So George Washington did uh, free his slaves most of the other slave owners who were at the time of the writing of the Constitution did not when they died. What do we make of that? Well, it, it's not an automatic denunciation because we have to understand the way the world was, but it's a very important fact that can't be swept under the, uh, swept under the rug when we're trying to understand the history of the United States. So during the American Revolution, the patriots were supposedly fighting against the slavery of parliament and the United States came into existence protecting the institution of slavery for African Americans. When it came to Native Americans, the uh, new American nation was uh, despicable in its actions toward this minority. So the, the, the historians are gonna always say the picture was mixed and any simple depiction of America as a Christian nation early on just needs a lot more fleshing out 
in order to be historically accurate. Okay. Where would you say this desire to make them more than who they were, where does that come from? Where does, from where does that originate? I think quite a bit of the modern debate over whether the United States had a Christian origin or not is really not driven by a concern for getting the history right, but it's driven by a concern for public life in the present. Contemporary political discussions fog up the historical question because if, if people have a particular point of view they want to work for in the expression of religion in public space or the uh, denial of the expression of religion in public space, the tendency is to grasp hold of bits and pieces of that earlier history that supports what I want to say. On, on the question of the Founding Fathers, there were some, like, for example, Samuel Adams of, of Massachusetts, who would inject very explicit language about Jesus and about the need for salvation. But there were those like Thomas Jefferson, who, who would have been much less inclined toward the traditional understanding of Christian faith. But in the current debate, Adams is grasped hold of by people who want to defend the Christian American concept. Jefferson is grasped hold of by people who want to defend, as the authors of one book call it, a godless constitution. So the history gets muddled when it's brought to bear for current debates. And I actually happen to be quite sympathetic with many of the, the proposals in public of people who claim a Christian American foundation but I also think that they do their efforts in the present a disservice by exaggerating some elements that were present in the founding period and neglecting some of the unsavory parts of early American history that were also a major fact in America's founding. Mark, you talked about unsavory parts uh, in your last comment. Uh, how do you, for, as you look and, and hear them present and talk about things, how do you find them treating those unsavory parts in their conversations, in their speeches? Uh, slavery is the great anomaly for um, um, early American history, and it's an anomaly, it's a problem, because Britain, that supposedly was enslaving the colonists, had a stronger movement to get rid of slaves before the United States. So, Britain bans the slave trade in 1807, and the United States follows uh, suit. Britain banned slavery in the early 1830s completely, and the United States does not follow suit. So you have the strange situation that the supposedly tyrannical mother country frees its actual slaves without a civil war a full generation before that takes place in the United, in, in the United States. Now, what you want to make of that in terms of a Christian interpretation can differ, but simply to ignore that history, to ignore that contrast, is, is just irresponsible. And to the extent that one wants to have a Christian view of the past, that should involve a, a humbleness about one's own origins and, and willingness to say that even some of the, the people who were the very best in some ways did some things that were terribly wrong. And, and the enslavement of Africans is the most conspicuous of those. There's absolutely no justification for it, but that's there in, in the record. And the treatment of Native Americans, uh, I think originally uh, many, many of the settlers had some, some good motives, they wanted to get along, but there's always a self-interest that corrupts Christians as well as non-Christians, and particularly when you get in uh, political situations, self-interest tends to overcome uh, good intentions. And that's what happened with the Native Americans. That instead of getting along, they began to take their land away and treat them unfairly. And so even people who were professing Christians, well-meaning Christians, end up doing the wrong thing. What kind of America would the Christian roots, quote unquote, uh, adherents like to see now? Defenders of Christian morality are uh, concerned about, and I would say rightly concerned about, the, the, the dissolution of marriages, the, uh, the, the immoralities that are uh, uh, visible in public, the, uh, the fragility of, of uh, generation to generation contact. And these, I think, are really quite legitimate concerns. The, the, the difficulty is in arguing for these on the basis of a partially correct, partially incorrect, partly historical, partly mythological past. 
it'd be far better, I think, to try to frame arguments that appeal to the broad population that exists in the United States, the pluralistic religious po population that exists, and, and when history is evoked, to get the history right. That would be much better. Yeah, I think you have a much stronger argument if you get the history right. I've been, I've been a strong advocate of encouraging religious perspectives in higher education, which I think is one of the, one of the concerns of uh, conservative people today is we have such a secular worldviews that, that are prevail in the education. I think it's, it's very important for Christians to have a voice, but to have a voice, I think you have to treat the other side fairly, be willing to be self-critical of your own tradition and say, uh, if we have a voice, other people ought to have a voice too and try to, try to treat everyone with, with equity. So then, are there dangers uh, in promoting America as a Christian nation? The, the danger of a simplified picture of America as a Christian nation is an inability to be self-critical, it's an inability to look upon those who have other points of view as also made in God's image. It's an inability, I think, to be able to address, as they should be addressed, the current problems that we have. If our history that we're drawing upon to make current arguments is flawed, is tendentious, is partial, then it undercuts the current arguments that we're trying to make as Christian believers in, in a modern society. So, the, the Christian America uh, uh, effort, if it pushes to better history, if it, if it pushes to history that is able to admit some problems as well as some strength, that's probably a good thing. But when the Christian America notion is taken to be a, 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 a tool or an instrument in modern political debate, then it can become very dangerous very easily. George and I think it, it's, it's one that's even dangerous for, for people who do promote it in, in their pulpits and, and the like, that when their young people begin to study the American past and find out, you know, what my, my pastor told me wasn't true. What are they supposed to think? And, and it might lead them to, to question, question other things. So I, I, I don't think it's ever a good strategy to uh, you know, exaggerate the facts, to change the facts in order to, to, to make a current point. It seems in this conversation, meaning the, the conversation in, in culture, that it is really fairly divisive. But what do you think would be a more unifying vision? Well, Christians yeah. should be reconcilers, and, 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 and that doesn't mean that they should just let secular people dominate and push you around or, or change, change all the laws. I think you need to, to advocate uh, for principle. And, and, and I think the people who are talking about Christian America are standing for a lot of good principles. But when you do that, you have to do it in a fair, reconciling sort of way that, that stops and not only talks, but also listens to the other side and says, I can see the, the, you know, the, the, this is the strongest part of your point of view. Here's my point of view. Let's listen to each other. That's going to make a lot more progress than simply confrontation and shouting at each other and developing mythologies. And it's just a bad mythologies on the other, on the secular side as well. When, when you've seen this happen in terms of people actually having a good, solid discourse that is respect, you know, respects the other side, can you give any examples or when, when it does work? Well, I, I have seen that in, in advocating in, 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 in higher education, that, that there are people who are militantly secular and say any kind of Christian talk in higher education is nonsense, it's ridiculous, we sh you know, it's, it's unscientific. Uh, but there, there, if, if one is willing to uh, be open to other perspectives, there, there are people who will respond and say, yes, I see, th I, I see that, that makes sense. Uh, we, th there are some things that have been lost by being so thoroughly secular and, and will, will, will be open. And often it has to do with uh, how you treat the people on the other, the, the other, the, the other side and, and, and the sense of respect that you're projecting. Mark. I'm, I'm impressed in an academic circle, in academic circles with how 
discussion of Abraham Lincoln has developed in, in the last 10 and 15 years. There's been a real serious set of books on Lincoln and Lincoln's religion. So here, here's, a, here's a person who, in his second inaugural address, probably made the most effective use of the scriptures of any president in any public address. So is Abraham Lincoln then a Christian president? Well, the good, the good research shows that he was never a church member. He was uh, spotty in his church attendance, at least till right toward the end of his life. And the evidence is not so clear. Academically, it's been pretty easy for historians working in the sources, emphasizing different parts of Lincoln's career to get together. Now that's a much easier task because it deals with someone who lived from the early 19th century to 1865 than it is in the, the red hot political discussions of the present. But the same kind of process could, I think, be employed. Respect for those who differ, strong defense of your principles, recognizing that the people with whom you differ are also people made in the image of God who deserve respect by others who are made in the image of God. George, Mark, thank you so much for being on the program today. My guests today have been Mark Knoll and George Marsden of the University of Notre Dame History Department, who specialize in evangelical Christianity and early American history. I'm Scott Welch. Thank you for joining us and for watching Intercompass.